We're starting. Uh, uh, welcome to uh, Cedar Lane United Methodist Church and our Sunday school lesson for April the 10th, 2022. Our lesson today is from Matthew chapter 26. And the topic is the Lord's Supper, which occurred on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread during what we call now today Holy Week. As a background for this topic, I want to tell you a little bit about what John Wesley said about sacraments. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament. We don't know what the future holds for our denomination. So I've been reading for some time about what Wesley said in his sermons and other writings. He wrote a lot of letters in order to get a background on the roots of Methodism. I personally think that if our denomination has a future, we need to start by re-examining our roots. The whole thing's a fascinating subject. Wesley ministered during a tumultuous time, which is very much like the time we're experiencing today. He said lots of things that are really relevant to today. Consequently, as long as we're still United Methodists, it's probably a good idea to take a minute and see what John Wesley said about this important topic of sacraments. As you may know, the Lord's Supper and baptism are the only two sacraments recognized by the United Methodist Church. As I understand it, this followed the teachings of the Anglican Church of which Wesley was an ordained minister. And it differed from the Catholic Church, which in addition to recognizing baptism and the Lord's Supper, also recognized confirmation and penance and anointing the sick and ordination and marriage as sacraments. At this point, you may ask, as I asked myself, what is a sacrament and what does it matter anyway? John Wesley's definition of sacraments followed the definition of the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. There, a sacrament, sacrament is defined as an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace given to us, ordained by Christ himself, as a means whereby we receive the same. Wesley had a, a broader category of things he called the means of grace. He had a very famous sermon called, called the means of grace, which he defined as outward signs, words, or actions ordained by God and appointed for this end to be ordinary channels whereby we might convey to men preventing justifying, and sanctifying grace. The book of discipline defines grace as the undeserved, unmerited, and loving action of God in human existence through the ever-present Holy Spirit. It's often defined as unmerited favor. And as the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Which God has prepared in advance for us to do. When Wesley thought about grace, he thought about Preventing, justifying, or sanctifying grace. Preventing grace is sometimes called prevenient grace. And that's the grace by which God draws us to himself. You might consider this grace of God working through our natural conscience and through the world around us 
we become aware of our sin and brokenness. Next, Wesley talked about justifying grace, and that's the forgiveness we get made possible by Christ's sacrifice on the cross. We are justified before God and freed from sin. Finally, we experience sanctifying grace. Through sanctifying grace, we are made holy so that we can live with God for all eternity. As the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. <laughs> you know, it's hard. I, I wouldn't count myself as holy. <laughs> Far from it. But it's become aware to me that if I'm going to spend eternity with God, I've got to get holy sooner or later. Better get started. Wesley said that these types of grace are the core of Methodist theology. In a letter, he said, our main doctrines, which include all the rest, are three. Of repentance, of faith, and of holiness. The first of these we account, as it were, the porch of religion. The next, the door. And the third, religion itself. For, ho for Wesley, holiness was religion itself. And that brings us back to the Lord's Supper. John Wesley said that the Lord's Supper is a sacrament. To review the definition again, a sacrament is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace given to us, ordained by Christ himself, as a means whereby we receive the same. As a sacrament, the, the, the Lord's Supper is also a means of grace. It's an outward sign or symbol of an inward and spiritual reality which is made possible for us by God's grace through faith. But it is also a means or tool by which we receive and accept God's grace. Through faith, the Holy Spirit brings us into communion with God and with each other spiritually. And this spiritual oneness is God's goal for our lives. It's something that God does for us as we allow him to remake us into his image. Wesley talked about other means of grace, including the sacrament of baptism and the Lord's Supper. In particular, he talked about prayer and studying the Bible. Although prayer and Bible study are not sacraments, Wesley did think them, of them as ordinary and usual ways of receiving God's grace. By doing these things, we place ourselves in a position to let the Holy Spirit remake us from within. One of the things he says is if God does it, does it you have to wait on God to do it. And if you're, if you're waiting, you might as well be doing something productive. <laughs> and so you, 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 you pray and, and you read the Bible and what you're doing is putting, you, putting yourself in a position to let God do the work. You can't do it. And boy, I know I can't do it. But what I can do is put myself in a position to let God do it. And that's what he's talking about here. Well, looking at the big picture, the United Methodist Church divides the means of grace into two major categories or spiritual disciplines works of piety, and works of mercy. Each of these two categories is then subdivided into two subcategories of individual practices and communal practices. So let me go through what the Methodist Church says about the means of grace. Works of individual piety include reading and meditating and studying the scriptures, prayer, fasting, regularly attending worship, healthy living, and sharing our faith with others. Those are some individual means of grace, which they call piety. Communal works of piety include regularly sharing in the sacraments, 
something that Wesley called, and then something that Wesley called Christian conferencing, which is really small groups and large groups getting together and, make, and being accountable to each other, and then studying the Bible together. Individual works of mercy include doing good works, visiting the sick, visiting those in, in prison, feeding the hungry, clothing those who need clothing, giving generously to the needs of others. And then finally, communal works of mercy, including seeking justice, ending oppression and discrimination, and addressing the needs of the poor. Now, here's the thing. Over the years, I've got to come to a deeper appreciation that these mean, about these means of grace. You might call them spiritual disciplines or spiritual habits. Since I've been on this diet program, I, I see the power of habits. Habits are our identity. We are what we do to a large extent, and we especially are what we do regularly and routinely and repeatedly. And so these are spiritual habits. And whatever you call them, Wesley said they were a means of grace. I cannot make myself holy. I cannot do it. But I can put myself in a position to let God make me holy. Christ paid the penalty for our sins. But salvation is more than a get out of jail free card. Sooner or later, redemption has to lead to true holiness of mind and body. We cannot be with God forever unless we become holy as he is holy. To be perfectly unified with God, perfectly one with God, we got to be like God. And that means we have to be holy and pure. Got to do it sooner or later. Got to choose it sooner or later. God's goal for us, and Jesus said this in John chapter 17, is perfect oneness with the Godhead. We're to be one with God and one with Christ in the same way that Christ and the Father are one with each other. And that kind of unity leaves no room for sin. Now, we're all sinners. Like Paul said, I kind of agree of which I'm the first. You know, I'm a sinner. I know it better than anybody about myself. Mama used to say she, she, she had, she'd confess her sins to God and tell him because he knew it already. If he didn't know it, she wouldn't have told him. God's not going to take away our free will, even in heaven. I have to choose to go to heaven. And I have to choose to leave all my sin outside the pearly gates when I go in. The Bible says that the gates of heaven are never shut. I'm free to walk in. Everybody's free to walk in. But you have to leave your sin outside. Can't take it with you. I have to just let go of everything and step through the threshold. As Wesley said, this is God's work. He does it. And it's an interesting thing he said, because basically we just have to be willing. But he said, if God's doing the work, you'll never be more ready than you are right now. As the writer of Hebrews said, today's the day of salvation. Right now, never be more ready than this. So you just have to come as you are, exactly as you are with all the infirmities and bitterness or, or lack of love or, or selfishness 
You just have to come as you are and start. Take the first step. And then you need to take the second step. And then the third step. And then you just have to keep going. One step at a time. And if we fall down, we need to get back up and take another step and then another. And if we lose our way, God had told us about the one sheep. God's going to come looking for us. He's going to find us and lead us back. We don't have to do this alone. And we certainly don't have to do it in our own power. Now, with all that said, let me look at the Lord's Supper again. It's a sacrament and a means of grace. It's also something that Jesus commanded us to do. Baptism, you know, with the Great Commission, he told us to go baptize. And he told us to partake in the Lord's Supper in remembrance of him. So it's a command. And that's another thing Wesley said. Well, if it's a command, you, you, you really ought to do it. In today's lesson in Matthew chapter 26, we read, while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I'll tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new for you in my father's kingdom. You know, I, I thought about this a little bit and I didn't research it enough to know. But Jesus gave the cup and said, all of you take it. Was Judas there? Or had he already left? I think he was there. You know, we have an open table in the, in the United Methodist Church. Everybody's welcome. Well, if Judas was there, that's a good reason to believe that we should have an open table. God didn't refuse him a chance, which evidently he didn't take. But when Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, and that's in another, in Luke's version of this story. He was telling us that this was something we were supposed to continue after, to do after he was gone. It was supposed to be a means of remembrance. But it is also supposed to be a symbol of something more important that would take place when we're all united around a table in God's heavenly kingdom. Jesus said at the end of that, what I just read, I, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day I drink it new with you in the Father's kingdom. So he was telling them what they were doing there was a symbol of something much more important and so, something much bigger that's going to happen in eternity. As John Wesley said, it's an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. It's a symbol of the unity we're going to have with God and with each other in heaven. This symbol was a partial fulfillment of the symbol of the Paschal Lamb eaten during Passover. When Jesus told his disciples to eat his body, and drink his blood, he was alluding to Passover. This was a Passover meal. Matthew tells us this meal was eaten on the evening of the 15th day of the first month of the year. That's the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Paschal Lamb is uh, sacrificed the day earlier on the 14th, but it's right at the beginning, right before dusk, on the 14th, and then they eat the meal after dark on the 15th. The day starts at, at dusk. 
and um, it's a it's a lunar calendar, so that's why it comes in different times. Of, but it's usually in March or April, and that's when we celebrate Holy Week too. The first and last days. Uh, uh, well, let, let me go back. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is a seven day, in some places eight days, celebration. It starts on the 15th and goes through the 21st of the month. And they don't eat leavened bread then. And it goes back to the Exodus. Uh, when, when after the Passover occurred, you know, they sacrificed the Paschal lamb, put blood on the door, the angel of death passed them by. And then it was time to leave. And God was telling them, you know, you better get out of town in a hurry. And it takes time for bread to rise if you've got leaven in it. So sometimes unleavened bread's called the bread of haste. And so, so they were supposed to eat unleavened bread while they were leaving because they were in a hurry. And they remember that each, day, each year in this one week feast of unleavened bread. And the first day is the day they eat the, on that evening when it first begins is when they eat the Passover meal. So the meal the disciples had with Jesus was the Passover meal. And Jesus, you notice he talks about bread and wine, but he doesn't talk about a lamb because he's the lamb. In the first chapter of John's gospel, the Bible says that about the time Jesus was baptized, Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and proclaimed, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The next day, Jesus said something similar in front of two of John's own disciples. I mean, John, John said something different, similar. Oh, boy. John said something similar in front of two of John's disciples. John said, look, the Lamb of God. At that point, the two disciples left John and became disciples of Jesus. And the Bible says one of those disciples was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So from the very beginning, John, they were, they were aware that Jesus in some way was the Lamb of God, a Paschal Lamb, sacrificed to take away the sins of the world. During Passover, on the night of his death, the Lord brought up this imagery again, inviting his disciples to partake of his body and blood and think of him as the lamb sacrificed for their sins. This was supposed to be a Passover meal, but Jesus never talks about the lamb because he's the lamb. The bread and wine are now symbols of his body and blood. The tradition of the Lord's Supper continued with the early church. Eating to get, and this is something that really didn't hit me till just lately. Eating together was an important part of the Christian life from the beginning. And breaking bread and drinking wine in remembrance of Christ were part of that tradition. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, the Bible says that the early church focused on four things. Teaching, fellowship, breaking bread, and prayer. Breaking bread was one of four things that the early church focused on. Food is very important. And, you know, I just think what y'all are doing for feeding other people is just exactly what God wants done. Anyway, 
Then in that same passage, the Bible says, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those that are being saved. Temple courts, house to house. This is the way it worked. Big groups like our morning worship service, the temple courts, and house to house. Small groups where they got intimate with each other and eat, ate meals together. They met together in large groups and small groups. And in the small groups, they broke bread together on a regular basis. In truth, eating meals together has always been a major way in which people bond with each other from the very beginning of mankind. And it's also been a major way we express our faith. Passover has been part of the Jewish life for thousands of years now, and the Lord's Supper has been part of Christian life for about 2,000 years. John Wesley said that as a sacrament, the Lord's Supper was an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace given to us, ordained by Christ himself, as a means by which we receive the same. Now, what does it mean, a means by which we receive the same? Well, it's a way we receive the, the real McCoy, the real deal. It's just a tool but it's a way that we put ourselves in a position to receive the real deal. And so I, I wanna conclude this just by saying, by going over some of the things the Methodist church says are the kinds of real deals, real graces that we can receive through Holy Communion. I looked in the beginning of the hymnal at a service of word and table one, which is the, uh, uh, the Holy Communion service, just to see what it talked about. The service begins by talking about grace, unmerited favor, and then it asks the Holy Spirit to clean, cleanse our hearts. There's an opportunity to confess our faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed. There's an opportunity to pray for the needs of other people, as Danny just did this morning. After that, we're invited to the, come to the Lord's table and we confess our sins before God. We all recite together a confession. There's something really great about that. And after that, we're invited to come to the Lord's table. We offer signs of love and reconciliation with each other, they call it the passing of the peace. And the pastor says, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And we repeat the same thing back to him. It's forgiveness. After this time of preparation, each of us receives the bread and cup. This is followed by a time of thanksgiving and praise. And the whole service is something that we do together. It's not the preacher doing it and we're sitting there listening. We're all participating together. It's something we do as a group. So what are the injured graces that we can potentially receive through this service? I'm just going to list them. That's the end of this. We can experience God's presence. We can experience a cleansing and sanctification of our hearts. We have an opportunity to confess our sins before God, an opportunity to confess our faith publicly, a chance to reconcile with others and heal broken relationships, a chance to express forgiveness, a chance to offer God our thanksgiving and praise because there's a, a great thanksgiving is part of that. So it's a, there's a time set apart for thanksgiving and praise. Finally, it's a chance to experience community. It's something we all participate in together. The Lord's Supper is really pretty great. So I 
last thing I'm going to say is I encourage you to read the service in the front of the hymnal sometime and meditate on it. I think it'll be worth your time. Now you need to show me how to turn this thing off.